If I'm sitting next to a swimming pool and somebody dives in, and she's not too pretty, so I can think of something else, I think of the waves and things that have formed in the water. And uh, when there's lots of people have dived in the pool, there's a very great choppiness of all these waves all over the water. And to think that it's possible, maybe, that in those waves is a clue as to what's happening in the pool. That some sort of insect or something with sufficient cleverness could sit in the corner of the pool and just be disturbed by the waves. And by the nature of the irregularities and bumping of the waves, have figured out who jumped in, where and when, and where, what's happening all over the pool. And that's what we're doing when we're looking at something. Uh, the light that comes out is, is waves, just like in the swimming pool, except in three dimensions instead of the two dimensions of the pool. It's they're going in all directions. And we have an eighth of an inch black hole into which these things go, which uh, is particularly sensitive to the parts of the waves that are coming in a particular direction. It's not particularly sensitive when they're coming in at the wrong angle, which you say is from the corner of our eye. And if we want to get more information in the corner of our eye, we swivel this ball about so that the hole moves from place to place. Then uh, it's quite wonderful that we can see, figure out so easy. <laughs> That's really because the light waves are easier than the, the waves in the water are a little bit more complicated. It would have been harder for the bug than for us, but it's the same idea, to figure out what the thing is that we're looking at at a distance. And this is kind of incredible because when I'm looking at you, someone standing to my left could see somebody who's standing at my right. That is, the light could be going right across this way, the waves are going this way, the waves are going this way, the waves are going this way. It's just a complete network now, it's easy to think of them as arrows passing each other, but that's not the way it is, because all it is is something shaking. It's called the electric field, but we don't have to bother with what it is. It's just like the water height is going up and down. So there's some quantities shaking about here, and in a combination of motions that's so elaborate and complicated that the result is to produce an influence which I, makes me see you, at the same time completely undisturbed by the fact that there are influences that represent the other guy seeing him on this side, so that there's this tremendous mess of waves all over in space, which we call, which is the light bouncing around the room and going from one thing to the other. Because, of course, most of the room doesn't have eighth-inch black holes. It's not interested in that light, but the light's there anyway. I mean, it bounces off this and it bounces off that, that all this is going on, and yet we can sort it out with this instrument. But beside all that, you see, that those waves that I was talking about in the water, maybe they're so big, some of them, and then you could have slower swashes, which are longer and shorter. And perhaps our animal who's making his study is only using waves between this length and that length. So it turns out that the eye is only using waves between this length and that length, except those two lengths are hundred millionths, of, hundred thousandths of an inch. Yeah, hundred thousandths of an inch, people. And uh, what about the slower swashes, the waves that go more slowly, that have a longer distance from crest to trot? Those represent heat. We feel those, but our eye doesn't see them focused very well. We don't, in fact, at all. Uh, the shorter waves are blue, the light, you know, every, and the longer waves are red. But when it gets longer than that, we call it infrared. All this is in there at the same time. That's the heat. Uh, pit vipers that you got down here in the desert, they have a little thing that they can see the longer waves and pick out mice which are radiating their heat, their longer waves, by their body heat, by looking at them with this eye, which is the pit of the pit viper. But we can't, we don't, are able to do that. And then these waves get longer and longer and they're all through the same space. All these things are going on at the same time. So that in this space, there's not only your, my vision of you, but information from Moscow radio that's being broadcast at the present moment and the singing of somebody from Peru. All the radio waves are just the same kind of waves, only longer waves. And there's the radar from the airplane, which is looking at the ground to figure out where it is, which is coming through this room at the same time, plus the X-rays, <laughs> cosmic rays, and all these other things, which are the same kind of waves, exactly the same waves, but shorter, faster, or longer, slower. It's exactly the same thing. So this big field, this, this area of irregular motions of this electric field, this vibration, contains this tremendous information, and it's all really there. That's what gets you. 
If you don't believe it, then you pick a piece of wire and connect it to a box. And in the wire, the electrons will be pushed back and forth by this electric field, swashing just at the right speed for a certain kind of long ways. And you turn some knobs on the box to get the sloshing just right, and you hear Radio Moscow. Though you know that it was there. How else did it get there? It was there all the time. It's only when you turn on the radio that it, you notice it. But that all these things are going through the room at the same time, which everybody knows. When you, but you've got to stop and think about it to really get the pleasure about the complexity, the inconceivable <laughs> nature of nature. Richard Feynman's explains the inconceivable nature of light very elegantly. But could a deeper understanding of time as a physical process give us an objective understanding of this that fits in with the reality of our everyday life? The theory explained in the rest of this video is based on just two simple postulates. The first is that the quantum wave particle function or probability function of quantum mechanics represents the forward passage of time itself, photon by photon. And the second is that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that is formed by the probability function is the same uncertainty we have with any future event within our own reference frame. This process of continuous creation, or change, we see and feel as the flow of time itself, and we can interact with it, turning the possible into the actual. Therefore, we are able to tune a radio into Radio Moscow, collapsing the radio waves into new photons, representing new moments of space and time within our own reference frame. This theory is based on Einstein's theories of relativity and a deeper understanding of quantum mechanics. In this theory, the quantum of quantum mechanics is a unit of energy that we see and feel as the flow of time itself. Time is continuously being formed, photon by photon, by the spontaneous absorption and emission of light waves of electromagnetic radiation, a process of continuous change continuous energy exchange, forming the future uncertainty of everyday life. This uncertainty can be seen mathematically as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle of quantum physics. This might sound mad, but the probability function that forms the uncertainty principle also forms the movement of electric charge, forming the flow of electric current with electrical potential. In this theory, electrical potential and the individual's future potential are the same within their own reference frame. The most advanced part of this universal process is in the form of electrical activity in the brain being able to comprehend and measure this process as the flow of time with a past and uncertain future. This process is totally universal and interactive from the largest object to the smallest creature, right down to the smallest element of the periodic table, will slow the rate that time flows, forming a curvature of space-time relative to its own energy or mass. If our eyes were more sensitive to the different wavelengths of light, we would be able to see that everything is radiating electromagnetic light waves continuously. This forms a great dance of energy exchange, forming a process of spontaneous and continuous change that we see and feel as the aging process and as the flow of time itself. In this theory, gravity is a secondary force to the electromagnetic force. Objects just free fall towards the greatest mass or energy because it has the slowest rate that time flows. The second law of thermodynamics falls out of this theory, the organization for the spontaneous disorganization of entropy is formed by the spherical symmetry of the quantum wave particle function. The spontaneous absorption and emission of light forms the flow of time with photon energy cascading down forming greater degrees of freedom for the flow of entropy. 
we have an infinite number of reference frames within our universe, and because light has momentum, and momentum is frame dependent, each object or observer will have their own reference frame with their own future uncertainty as time unfolds, photon by photon. Therefore, an observer can look back in time at the beauty of the stars in all directions from the centre of their own reference frame. This is because they are forming their own space-time by collapsing the waves of light into new photon oscillations, forming their own future potential. An artist will take energy and time to create a work of art, because the atoms of the hand and eye have bonded together, forming the movement of electric charge, creating their own potential future. Creation is truly in the hand and eye of the beholder in this theory. Below I have placed a link to a video that explains the mathematics that represents this geometrical process. Thanks for watching. Please share and subscribe. It will help the promotion of this theory